Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from a wet Nelson Mandela Bay. My name is Paul Swint, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations at Nelson Mandela University. A warm welcome to all alumni, staff, students, and friends of our university. A special welcome to our speaker today, alumnus and sales and marketing graduate, Mike Abel. Mike will share some food for thought with us with this talk entitled, What Jamie Oliver Can Teach Us About Thought Leadership Today. This webinar, ladies and gentlemen, is part of a collaborative series presented by the Nelson Mandela University Business School and the Alumni Relations Office. The director of the Business School, Dr. Randall Jonas, will be facilitating the session with us this afternoon. Before handing over to Dr. Jonas, just a very short introduction of our speaker, quoting from his recently released book, Willing and Able, Lessons from a Decade in Crisis. I'm just reading something to give you a taste of what's in it, and there's a lot of reading that you'll still need to do. But about the author and about Mike Abel, with 30 years of experience in the FMCG financial services, automotive and retail advertising, Mike Abel is recognized as one of Africa's leading marketing, advertising and communication specialists. He has co-led the largest communications group in Africa, Ogilvy South Africa. He ran the prestigious MNC Saatchi Group in Australia. And in February 2010, he founded MNC Saatchi Abel, which to date is credited with being the fastest growing advertising agency in the history of South Africa. Quite a remarkable feat. That's just the first paragraph. So I'll just quickly jump to the last paragraph of this introduction. Under the toughest economic climate, Mike and his partners have built a top five communications company in South Africa, one that is regarded as the jewel in the crown of the MNC Saatchi Group. MNC Saatchi Abel is involved in various social impact initiatives, including the street store, the world's first free pop-up clothing store for the homeless. That's just a small taste, ladies and gentlemen. And if you read a book, there's a lot more, but without any further ado, let me hand you over to Dr. Randall Jonas, will give you some further information. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to greet you this afternoon from Nelson Mandela University Business School and our speaker in Cape Town, Mr. Mike Abel and Paul Pesquint and Anne, of course. We are very, very privileged to host Mike today in our discussion around Jamie Oliver and thought leadership. And I was wondering now, what the heck does Jamie Oliver have to do with thought leadership? And as you think about things, then the meaning of things become more, uh, you know, uh, more, you know, we can make more of, of the meaning of what the person is saying. And to open up this session this afternoon, I thought maybe I should go back to the great philosopher Descartes, who said, I think, therefore I am. So thought is part of our being human. And if you look at the ancient Greeks, for example, they, had, they were men of ideas, philosophers with thought, leadership, that actually laid the foundations for modern society today. But today, in the modern 21st century, the year of COVID, the year of the 4 IR and blockchain, we also have thought leaders. And Mike Abel is a thought leader in himself because of the ideas that comes from the lessons that he has learned through crises in the last 10 years but also what he's going to share today. And using Jamie Oliver is quite a tasty way in doing that. So I'm going to hand you over to Mike. But before I do that, just process. At the end of Mike's presentation, there will be a QA. and a In other words, I will look at your chat line in your chats. You can put your questions there, even some comments that you want to make. I will pick them up and I will put them to Mike and Mike will respond. After that, of course, please don't forget there will be a survey that when we, the SIP webinar has ended, there will be a survey. Please, it just takes you about three or five questions that you must answer. It's not higher grade questions. It's plain and simple, easy questions for you to answer. So without further ado, let us have a taste of Mike and Jamie Oliver. Mike, over to you. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Dr. Jonas. And thank you very much, Paul, for the very warm welcome.
uh, saying thank you very much for the welcome. I see I was muted there for a moment. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you this afternoon. So thank you, Dr. Jonas, and thank you, Paul. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing this presentation. And I think it's a very uh, pertinent time, really, to be um, sharing this presentation with you because um, we find ourselves in an unusual world right now. And, uh, and I think that new solutions are called for. And so it's lovely to be back at the alma mater all these years later uh, and to be sharing the story. Um, and it's interesting that uh, the talk this afternoon is about Jamie Oliver, because just last week, um, when I was in Nelson Mandela Bay launching my book, um, the headline said, Entrepreneur Abel's Recipes for Success. So we seem to be continuing the theme of the Jamie Oliver cookbook. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a PE boy. Both my parents were born in Nelson Mandela Bay or Port Elizabeth at the time. And uh, if you look at my sons, I've got three boys. Uh, all four sets of grandparents were born in Nelson Mandela Bay. So our roots run deep in that city and, uh, and quite unusual. So uh, left grey in 84, uh, studied at the Nelson Mandela Bay a Metropolitan University, was very happy there. Uh, started off studying actually architecture, changed to do a BA psychology, and then eventually changed to do the three-year marketing and sales management uh, diploma, which I uh, enjoyed greatly uh, and learned an enormous amount under then Dr. John Berger and Chris Foster and, a, and an amazing team of lecturers. Anyway, came up to Cape Town, did the postgraduate at the AAA School of Advertising. After that, um, I joined an agency called the White House. Cape Town uh, started working on the Woolworths account very early on in the repositioning of Woolworths. Some of you may recall how Woolworths was on a gray background written in purple, like a toothpaste writing back in those days. And I led the repositioning of it to uh, the Willies that we know today uh, and helped create a writer strategy called Discover the Difference. So when you look at Willies today and you see those ads, the difference that goes all the way back to uh, almost 30 years ago, quite remarkable. And then I was sent at the young age of 21 to start, or 22 actually, to start the White House in Johannesburg, part of the DDB network. And um, we uh, pitched on eight accounts back in those days. We won all eight accounts and the agency took off like a rocket. But I've always believed that you should never learn from yourself, you should learn from the best. So to be a young man of 23 working in an advertising agency, not learning from anybody up there, um, I was approached by the Ogilvy Group to work on Volkswagen, um, another famous brand in the Port Elizabeth, Uton Hague area. And I worked very closely on VW for a period of 15 years, directly and indirectly, and was part of the team that led Volkswagen from 8% market share to 22% sustained market share over a decade. Um, involved in some of those very famous ads, the David Kramers that you will remember, uh, the road trip of the father and the son for Tuareg, um, the uh, laugh of a beetle. I remember the days of my life. Thanks, Dad. Uh, a wonderful, a wonderful part of uh, of my career. I ended up running um, Ogilvy Cape Town at the young age of 32. Um, focused my sights firmly on um, Johannesburg as a market, and eventually, over a few years, uh, grew it into the largest ad agency in South Africa. And then in 2006, I took over as the COO of Ogilvy South Africa Group in partnership with a lady called Nunu Nchengila. And uh, I was there until 2008. And then following an armed robbery and the ESCOM crisis and uh, Jacob Zuma becoming uh, the president, if one can call it that, um, I was offered the position to run the MNC Saatchi Group in Australia which is the largest advertising group in that region. Uh, so my wife and I and our three boys went off to base ourselves in Sydney, and I ran a group across uh, Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and it's a very interesting thing, and I share this story very specifically because a lot of people in South Africa today question their future in South Africa. And um, there I was in Sydney, Australia, in a very beautiful home, in a very beautiful suburb, in a very beautiful city. And my wife and I missed South Africa like crazy. In fact, we even went to see Lady Smith Black Mambazo. Uh, and it wasn't the song Homeless, funnily enough, that got to us. Got to us. It was the entire um, 
concert, but we sat there with tears running down our cheeks. Um, and when I was approached by the MNC Saatchi Group in London, the PLC, to open up South Africa as part of my region, so I'd have Australia, I'd have New Zealand, and then South Africa, they didn't expect me to go back to South Africa, but my wife and I took the decision that it was a marvelous opportunity to go back and to start the agency in South Africa, because what we realized is um, we had chosen safe predictability as opposed to being able to make a vibrant contribution to the country in which we lived. Um, and, you know, Nelson Mandela said, um, may your decisions reflect your hopes and not your fears. And our decision to uh, go had reflected our fears, not our hopes. And so our decision to come back reflected our hopes. And uh, I think what I've demonstrated is even during the toughest times, you can create a success of something. So when I ran the MNC Saatchi Group Australia, the global financial crisis had just hit. Um, I uh, restructured the group in Australia during those very difficult times and led them actually during that crisis to have their most successful year yet. Um, and uh, when I started the agency, I started MNC Saatchi Able. Uh, we are the only agency in the global network where a local founder has his name next to the famous Saatchi brothers. Um, so that's a big honor for us and for um, Nelson Mandela University. And uh, when we opened it, it was an overtraded market and it was a downturned economy. And hopefully what I'm going to share is some lessons along the way, a lot of it in my book, around how you can actually build a business during the toughest times. Because good times, as they say, take care of themselves. So um, on to the talk today. What can Jamie Oliver teach us about business. Life is a wheel. The more you give, the more you get back. And I have found this to be true. And so my presentation today focuses on thought leadership and on sharing. A lot of people say to me, Mike, um, how is it that you are so comfortable sharing your RP, your intellectual property, how you've grown your company, what you think, how you go about stuff. And I believe that the more you give, being the operative word, the more you get back, being the gift and the reward. So I actually believe that sharing is very good for business. And a lot of companies are terrified of sharing. It's a huge mistake because sharing also brings business. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well as we go through our talk. And I extend the analogy. Most businesses, when they put out a press release or when they talk about themselves, it's about claiming. And when you claim stuff, of course, it's very uh, nice and uh, you might get a pat on the back, but nobody remembers it. But when you are inspiring, people remember what your firm is about, what you do, what your point of difference is, what your messages are. So again, for the audience today, think about how you can be more inspiring of your audiences as opposed to simply claiming what you do. So why Jamie Oliver? Why have I chosen him? Well, every day, Jamie Oliver not only serves delicious food in his restaurants, but he actually puts out his most valuable intellectual property, his recipes. Unheard of. I mean, how many of businesses do you know that puts out their various recipes and how they go about stuff? And he doesn't do it once. He does it many, many times, and he builds an enormous empire as a result of sharing these. Because what Jamie Oliver understands is by giving you the Jamie Oliver cookbook, it doesn't make you Jamie Oliver. And when I share my business secrets or recipes, it doesn't make somebody Mike Abel. What Jamie Oliver understands in sharing his recipes is it sim simply makes people better cooks. That is his objective. You know, if you have to speak to Phil Knight of Nike fame and you say to Phil, who is the enemy of Nike? He doesn't say Adidas or Reebok or Puma. He says apathy because he understands if he can get more people moving and off the couch, he can sell more tackies. And I think we always have to think about what do we want to do? Don't we want more people to become better runners? Don't we want more people to become better cooks? Because as that great saying goes, a rising tide raises all ships. So it's not really only about the recipe at all. What it really is about 
is it's about the story. It's about the layers. It's about the difference that you bring. And today in business, everyone thinks it's same, same, but different. But it's not about same, same, but different at all. Today, in order to cut through in business and to succeed, you have to simply be different. And there are many different ways of being different. You know, today we live in a very exciting world and it terrifies many people, but I like it. And that is social media in terms of how it can unlock opportunities for small businesses and how they can become famous. I'm going to sh show you a lovely uh, video. It's a clip uh, on YouTube that actually has, and TikTok, that became very famous recently. Um, it's a man who's driving to work in his truck. He's a potato laborer from Idaho. And uh, his name is uh, Jason Apodoka, sorry, Nathan Apodoka. And Nathan is driving to work and Nathan's truck breaks down. And so what he does is he hitches a ride on his skateboard behind another truck and he's drinking ocean spray cranberry juice. And he's listening to that famous track by Fleetwood Mac called Rumors. And um, he arrives at work and he uploads his video onto TikTok and he starts working. Have a look at this and I'll tell you what happens. So Nathan arrives at work and he uh, checks in on his TikTok account by 10.30 in the morning. At that stage, he has two and a half million views of his TikTok video, uh, all free for Ocean Spray Cranberry. Ocean Spray Cranberry starts flying off the shelf and Fleetwood Mac's Rumors song in that week goes to the top 10 of uh, iTunes music. Um, and so there you go. So for a company like mine, we might be very threatened, uh, seeing as we're an advertising agency and we do the advertising for famous brands like uh, Standard Bank and Nando's and uh, Takealot.com and many others. But I'm enthusiastic about this. I think that um, for companies, marketing companies and businesses to collaborate with content creation is an incredibly powerful thing. So what you need to do and what Nathan did um, accidentally, I guess, is as a brand to be distinct, to cut through. And so extending the metaphor of the Jamie Oliver, in a sea of a vegetarian variety, how do you become a Yotam Otolenghi? Um, in a sea of decadent desserts, how do you become a Nigella Lawson? <laughs> And Nigella's particular fame comes not from her recipe book, how she sits down to in the middle of the night and decides to choose between um, a dessert, a chocolate mousse, or a leftover a roast chicken. In a sea of sumptuous seafood, how do you become a Rick Stein? And he did it through his multi layered and multi plated uh, crustacean um, uh, seafood platters. Uh, you look at a man called Emeril de Gassier, and Emeril de Gassier is a Cajun chef. How does Emeril stand out? Well, every time he cooks something, he shouts the word, BAM! And we all know how... Um, Gordon Ramsay became famous with that potty mouth of his. So um, none of these are same, same, but different. They're all cooking different things and they've own, all got their own very distinctive style. So for your own uh, businesses, it's always good to think of yourself as a chef within that category, but how do you become distinctive? What do you do that is different, that is layered, and that's interesting? Because the truth is, it's not about what they do. They all do very similar things. The difference comes from how they do it. 
So do you re reinvent the wheel in any way? No, you just simply focus on creating the best possible wheel. And there's a wonderful story that we like to tell about a lady and her husband, and she's traveling through India, and she chances upon this man on the side of the road, and he carves the most exquisite lifelike elephants that she's ever seen. And she turns to this little man and she says to him, tell me, sir, how do you create these amazing lifelike elephants? And he says, well, it's very simple. I take my block of wood, I take my knife, and then I remove everything that isn't the elephant. And that's what we should do. We should remove everything that is extraneous to what we sell and then just focus on creating great stuff of beauty um, related to our businesses. And how does one do that? Two ways. One is through being fascinated by what we do. They are being curious by being insatiable, by knowing as much as we possibly can about our area of expertise. And then to be fascinating, to tell those stories in fresh and interesting ways. So how do you do it? Well, you own an asset, you go beyond your category, you have a strong opinion, and most of all, seeing as this presentation is about generosity of spirit, it's about sharing. So if you look at an asset that we own as a company, well, the Saatchi name, as you may know, is inextricably linked to art globally. And um, I have a passion for art. I grew up in a home uh, where my father owned uh, an art gallery and uh, furniture stores in Port Elizabeth called Hallis's. And so I combined my love of art and that of uh, Charles Saatchi of the Saatchi Gallery. And uh, we are inextricably linked today uh, with art. You'll see a very beautiful Nelson Makamo behind me. Um, this was the cover of Time Magazine, one of the Time Magazines last year, when one talks about the quality of African art um, we go beyond our category, uh, and uh, that is one of my founding partners of MNC Saatchi Abel, Robert Grace, talking about communications around forestry at uh, no less than the United Nations. So we look at our expertise and we say, how do we have a how do we remain fascinated and fascinating within the world we operate, and how do we go beyond our category? We have a strong opinion. Um, some of you may have read my uh, letter to uh, President Ramaphosa around uh, where I felt the country should be going in January. And it uh, was shared uh, tens of thousands of times around the country. Uh, and then um, my critique, I guess, to ministers Lamini Zuma and uh, um, other ministers around Tele, uh, around uh, COVID and how I thought they were mismanaging the situation. And um, people say to me, Mike, uh, in corporate South Africa, how do you feel comfortable being so outspoken? But I believe that the core to patriotism is to being outspoken, is speaking truth to power. I think uh, battening down the hatches, not putting your head above the parapet, isn't about being patriotic and about trying to fix your country. I think active citizenry being outspoken, being prepared to muck in and to make a difference and to try and create a sharing economy um, and, uh, and more of an inclusive culture is how you improve the country, not by being quiet and towing the party line. So I have a generosity of spirit. Um, one of the key executives and co-founders of our company, our group managing director, who's actually also a graduate uh, from uh, your university, uh, our university is Jason Harrison. He got his BCom from Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. And um, he talks about the first time I cried in advertising. He shows enormous vulnerability uh, in his articles. And as a result of that, he is uh, a thought leader in our industry. So I guess this is my cookbook. And the reason I decided to put it out is so many people over the years, um, you know, have asked me how we've built the company and a lot of people try and see me and have meetings with me to get business insight. And so what I wanted to do was to put out my own recipe book, if you like, to share those stories. Uh, recently, our um, agency, my partners in London, um, had a free uh, advertising um, training course, which they ran over a couple of weeks. And it's the most powerful and popular thing that they've actually done was uh, making this course available and free. 
and uh, it created enormous uh, interest in our company and a lot of different uh, business, uh, business opportunities took note of it. So again, generosity sharing. So I want to share something amazing with you because uh, just now um, we spoke about the street store. Paul mentioned the street store. So let me tell you about the street store. South Africa, one of the most unequal countries in the world, where the haves and have nots live side by side. People want to help, but aren't always sure how. And for the homeless, begging is degrading. We wanted to find a way to help bring people together, not just to give, but to connect. And so the street store was born. The world's first premises-free, rent-free, free pop-up store for the homeless. Somewhere safe to give and easy to collect. Made only from a few posters, people drop off and hang up donations. Then the homeless choose things they actually want and like. For many, used to rummaging in bins, this was their first dignified shopping experience. Shopping at the street store was for me very nice. The people was accepting me very with friendly faces. The idea captured the attention of the media, locally and around the world. Thousands of homeless were clothed and people were brought together like never before. But homelessness is international, so we went open source. The Street Store website allows anyone to download a printable toolkit to host their own street store, allowing street stores to pop up anywhere in the world. Now a brand new way of helping the homeless. Es un proyecto que nace en Sudáfrica. And it's now on Macaulay Avenue in Chattanooga. To date, 962 stores have popped up in cities around the world, clothing an estimated 500,000 people. But you can't host a street store every day. So we expanded the street store to hotel rooms. Guests often have items they no longer need. A street store hanger in each hotel room allows guests to donate their unwanted clothing. A simple idea designed to restore the dignity to the homeless in one city at the tip of Africa has become an ever-expanding global initiative for good that's touching the lives of so many people every day. You are sent from heaven. Thank you very much. There's no way I can pay you back. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, man. So had we not gone open source, had we not decided to share um, how you could print those posters, how you could run a street store, it never would have become a global movement that today has clothed over 500,000 homeless and poor people. So the question is, does it all matter? And the very simple answer is yes, sharing does matter. What we can learn from Jamie Oliver is hugely important. Why? because it inspires our existing clients, it inspires the colleagues that we work with, it attracts business to our companies, it attracts talent to our organizations, and it creates exposure. So by giving, you get back. By sharing, by being distinct, you remain top of mind. How has this worked for us? Well, we are very generous in what we share and what we put out every day. And if you have a look at our um, newspaper clippings and articles just this year, MNC Saatchi Abel has got a share of voice of five times greater than our nearest competitor. So when somebody is thinking of selecting an advertising agency, who are they likely to call? Not the people that claim, but the people that inspire and the people that share. Because the more you give, the more you give, but you, the more you get back. So let me share some thinking around why I wrote the book and then I'll take questions. Thank you. The purpose of the book is to later collection of stories, life experiences, wins, losses, the stuff that makes life, you know, 
Uh, I think too many people measure their life based on a great success or only success. Failure is a critical part of success, I guess. And then people have also asked me all the time, why do I feel so comfortable talking about our recipe of success? And when you talk about a recipe of success, I guess the idea of a cookbook came to mind. Jamie Oliver, for example. I mean, every single day, Jamie Oliver shares his uh, intellectual property with the world through his recipe books. And those recipe books don't turn other people into Jamie Oliver. They just make other people better cooks. Uh, so I thought I wanted to have a situation where I could share those stories in a very easy way with people. So the orientation of the book is to be useful. Um, it's kind of the rough and tumble of life. I think that the timing is really important in when this is coming out because we have been in the, I guess the most overtraded word right now is unprecedented times. We've had economic headwinds since the very day that we started the agency. It was shortly into the Zuma presidency, if one can call it that. So you can be like a plane and you can use those headwinds um, to adjust your flaps and to give you takeoff. And the plane analogy is a very close one to me because from the day that we decided to start MNC Saatchi Abel, our idea was to build an international airport, metaphorically, where we could start landing Dreamliners. We never wanted a gravel landing strip where we could land Piper Cubs. Our ambition was always to grow and develop the next great communications agency on the African continent. My mom, who was an academic, but realizing that the ivory tower would never uh, give her the lifestyle to which she aspired, went into real estate. She always used to say to me, Mikey, always start a business during tough times because good times take care of themselves. A very good friend of one of my partners, Denise, when we started the company, he said to Denise, one day when you look back at when you started the company, you're gonna reflect on it being the happiest times and the most exciting times. Well, I can tell you that that is utter nonsense. I don't reflect on the early days uh, with great fondness at all. In fact, I brought a, uh, as they say, say hello to my little friend. <laughs> so this is the frog. And this was given to me by one of my partners in the early days. And it's because I used to refer to myself as the frog kisser. Because every day I'd go out and I would pucker up <laughs> and I'd kiss a lot of frogs, hoping for a princess to pop out and most of them just remained frogs. <laughs> what the book forced me to do was to go back to those early days and to remember, you know, kissing the frogs, remember coming back to the agency and exciting people around the little ones. You know, I think a lot of people view life, and I know it's a bit cliched, but they view it as a, a destination. That's where I want to head to. That's where I want to get to one day. And the joy and beauty of life is every day. That for me is the joy in looking back is thinking about those small things, those small moments of success, those little bits of affirmation, because it took us 18 months until we won our first major account, which happened to be Heineken South Africa. So a lot of those big, bold decisions we took early, early on that helped us become who we are today, uh, I look back on those moments now and I think, were you mad? But at the time, not for a second did I ever think that MNC Saatchi Abel would be anything but successful. So wonderful chatting, wonderful sharing some stories and, uh, and very happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for that very, very interesting and exciting uh, presentation and talk. And uh, now we know how Jamie Oliver fits into the story. Interesting perspective and very philosophical, actually, I must say. Lots of lessons to learn from your talk and your life stories in the book. You've got a couple of questions, and I'm going to start off with one that I got uh, from the, for one of the first people that actually started questioning, make, uh, the, uh, putting down some questions. He asked, hi, Mike, do you have any advice for local business navigating through this COVID storm? Looking forward to reading your book, and thanks a lot. That comes from Dennis. Thank you. Great. Give that. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Dennis. You know, um, when COVID started, um, and I had to shut the company, and uh, when I say shut the company, I mean 
um, in terms of the physical location, not in terms of the way we operated. Uh, I spoke to all staff the day before we closed and I said to them, here is a challenge for you. Imagine if we can do our best creative work and write our best marketing strategies during this period of time. Let us use this as a defining period of time, not one of succumbing to the crisis, but one of triumph. And then we put a sign on the door of our Cape Town and Joburg companies. And the sign said, our doors may be closed, but our minds are still open. And uh, everybody then went on to a remote working situation, which um, to be fair, 80% of my staff, so we employ 350 people in South Africa, and 80% of them still have not returned to the office. They are working remotely. And we have hired 70 people during COVID. And we have done uh, campaigns uh, for global companies like uh, TikTok. Um, we have one business, a uh, major business uh, during COVID. So what we've done is we said, if we focus on the negative, we're not going to survive this thing. If we focus on the positive and only what we can do, not what we can't do, because it's pointless focusing on what you can't do, we will triumph. You know, there's a wonderful story about the poet Wilfred Owen. Uh, he lived during the First World War. He wrote that very famous poem, Dulce et Decorum Est Pro Patria Mori, which means that he's sweet and honorable to die for one's country, which he cited as the greatest lie of all. But Wilfred Owen, who actually did die in the First World War, sadly, he said every night that he stood in the trenches, he was faced with a choice. He could either look down and see his feet in the mud, or he could look up and see the stars. And we determinedly chose to look up and see the stars at all costs. What I also did was together with my exco, we prioritized job retention over bottom line profits because we thought it was unconscionable to put people out onto the street while we were still um, in the black financially. And so we managed to retain 100% of our staff on 100% of their salaries throughout this crisis, prioritizing job retention over bottom line profits because we believe that when you do the right thing, you know, there's a huge difference between what you can do and what you should do. And a lot of people choose what you can do, but uh, inherent in that is not necessarily ethics. You should always do what you should do. And we prioritize job retention. And I think our staff and our clients understood what we were trying to do. And through our dogged determination to still provide hot resonant marketing solutions, we've retained our clients, we've retained uh, revenue. Obviously, when we look, when we end this year, we will end this year on 25% of what we imagined we would make in terms of our full year forecast. But that was putting humanity ahead of profits. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for that one. That's a very interesting perspective. I thought there's some actually lovely gems in what you were saying, some catchphrases. I've got another question for you coming from Shanae. She asks, how has the COVID-19 era influenced consumer spending and what categories of items are now pulling more advertising spend? Sure. Look, I think it's been a wonderful opportunity for e-commerce. Um, you know, a lot of people um, historically might not have been comfortable um, shopping online versus going to the mall. And obviously the safest way, certainly during the peaks of the pandemic to shop would have been uh, through uh, e-commerce. So people have trialed it, people have got used to it and it's broken into a new category. And if you look the world over, whether you're looking at the take a lots within the South African context or the Alibaba's or the Amazon share performance, um, e-commerce has performed incredibly strongly. Um, I think the other areas, uh, obviously, um, hospitality industry has suffered tremendously and how long it's going to take for that industry to come back is anybody's guess. But I think that what people have done is they have uh, prioritized their shopping, they've prioritized the way they live their lives. And, uh, and unfortunately, um, a lot of people have lost their income. So there've been very few winners, to be honest, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of COVID and businesses that have that have flown because there is just so much less money in circulation right now. So I think that the focus from all of us has to be how do we rebuild our economies? 
how do we shop local, how do we support local, and how do we get those businesses off the ground again? Because as I said, there are very few winners actually in this, um, but particularly, I guess, if you look at the hospitality industry, you look at restaurants, and then you look at the entire supply chain to that industry, um, a massive rebuild job has to be done there. Local holidays too. We need to get our all of our hotels, all of our um, game farms going again. So a big bonus would be to spend your money local, please. Thank you. And actually, Mike, that is part of the economic recovery strategy for this country is to look at localization. So that's very, very important. Thank you very much for that perspective. Mike, you got to listen to this one very, very carefully. Okay. All right. Hi, Mike. This is now coming from Andrew Bunning. Hi, Mike. Thank you for your very positive and informative presentation. I am in a similar creative industry, namely focusing on event management. Although having chosen to live in Port Elizabeth, we have also spread our wings to operate nationally and into Africa. So the question is, why do you think that companies are more accepted for their creativity and value outside of Port Elizabeth? Is it the economy? Is it the lack of vision or something else? The city is often quoted as being an excellent breeding ground for talent, but this talent does not appear to always be accepted on our own home turf. Your views? Thank you, Mike. Yeah. So I think that it's a very pertinent question because um, I've done a lot of consulting and a lot of well, pro bono consulting and work with the city of Port Elizabeth trying to get it, um, uh, I guess, considered or viewed at the level of which it is capable. And I think that the, the number one enemy, you know, I spoke earlier in my talk about um, Phil Knight saying that the enemy of uh, Nike is apathy. Well, the enemy of Nelson Mandela Bay or Port Elizabeth is low self-belief. For one reason or another, the city doesn't have a bold ambition for itself and doesn't go out and fetch that ambition. So when you look at Nelson Mandela Bay, it has got so many benefits. Um, it offers in many ways an unrivaled lifestyle. It offers affordability. It offers clean air. It offers great beaches. It offers outstanding schools outstanding tertiary education, and yet the city economically has never got to where it needs to be. And that's because it set the bar low and the ambition is being low. Now, I'm not saying in any way that your challenge isn't real. The challenge of a business operating outside of Nelson Mandela Bay um, to conquer South Africa as a market and to conquer a continent is incredibly tough. But then you need to be doing the work, and I'm not saying you're not in any shape or form, but that attracts that kind of attention, that breathtaking attention where people say, my word, have you seen the events and the activations that that particular company did out of Nelson Mandela Bay? That is who we should appoint to handle this. You also need to look at how you can pivot in terms of content generation. And obviously um, uh, you are an industry severely hit by uh, COVID. I mean, uh, you know, part of my group is a sports marketing and eventing company called Levergy, and they've absolutely had to pivot their business into the content uh, creation space um, and the online space because you simply haven't been able to do those events. But I think that if the work that you do is outstanding enough and riveting enough, um, I think it'll take off. I mean, part of the, my reason for getting involved uh, behind entering the Nelson Mandela Tower of Light project uh, which we won and that is hopefully going to be built one day um, at St. George's Park, is to create something big, iconic and dramatic that puts Nelson Mandela Bay on the map. But here, I'll give you an idea for your events and activation company that will make you very famous if you pull this off. So when you drive along the highway, you have the Campanile on your right-hand side, and on your left-hand side, you've got the worst hodgepodge of ugly and derelict buildings. What I encourage you to do is to talk to a paint company and then to talk to the best graffiti artists in the world and create the most mesmerizing graffiti wall in the world that rivals what you see in Miami along that whole stretch of highway. And that'll be an event and activation together with a paint company like a Plascon that people will look at and look at your eventing company and say, my God, look at the work those guys have done and hopefully that'll attract some business. 
Thank you, Andrew. And I'm sure, uh, Mike, I'm sure Andrew is listening and he's taking note of that. Um, I've got another comment actually from Craig Luckman. Hi, Mike. I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Very inspirational. Thanks for sharing, particularly your generosity of spirit. Looking forward to getting willing and able. And thanks also to our alma mater. Thank you very much, Craig, for those encouraging words. Charmy and Green, very good idea. Thank you very much for sharing. And then, of course, um, there's another one from Pulisandi. She asked, afternoon, Mike, please advise what skills or qualifications would you recommend for young people in this new world order? So they say the greatest offense against artificial intelligence is going to be creativity. And uh, I think that that is something that um, is, some, is something that we should all be focusing on, in, irrespective of which, of which industry we go into. And what I mean by um, creativity, I mean curiosity and to be brilliant problem solvers. You know, the biggest challenge today I see in business is people are jumping to solutions without correct problem verification. Problem understanding the root problem, verifying it as a root problem, and then trying to solve the problem as opposed to jumping to a solution. So when you look at uh, whichever industry you want to get into, um, be fascinated and be fascinating. Be curious, look for the angles. Um, you know, there's also a, a big watch out, which I can mention. Um, there's a great saying that there may be a gap in the market, but is there a market in the gap? And I've just read a very interesting book by Bob Iger, who is the former global C no, no, current global CEO of Disney Worldwide. And he said when he was at Disney, um, uh, sorry, before he joined Disney, he was with ABC and he bought a very big female interest magazine. And he'll never forget his boss walking into his office and saying, Bob, be careful of becoming the world's best uh, trombone oil salesman. Because even if you're number one in the world, they only sell five liters of trombone oil globally. And I think what one must always do when you choose a career and what you think of in terms of your own businesses is, is there a market in the gap as opposed to, is there just a gap in the market? And so you combine uh, commercial um, acumen, you combine um, uh, an opportunity in terms of growth within the market. You know, a market always has lots of contested space. You always need to look for the open space. Rather than entering the contested space, look at what you can be doing differently. Um, there's that great saying by Henry Ford that if he had asked his customers what they had wanted, they would have set a faster horse. Um, and understanding that, I guess if you get to a man like a Steve Jobs, who just gave people what they didn't know they wanted yet. And through that built the most valuable company in the world. So look for that opportunity, but just make sure that there's a solid market within that opportunity. And so whatever you choose to study, um, you need to be passionate about it and you need to be curious. If you chase money as a career, academically or when you go and study one day you will never be successful there's a wonderful saying that the bird of paradise never lands on the grasping hand and people that chase success never achieve it people that simply focus on doing their job brilliantly adding value solving problems with alacrity those are the people who succeed automatically through doing that as opposed to pursuing the material thank you thank you very much mike um I've got a few more questions to go through and I'm trying to push them through. Uh, Hugo Lopes asks the question, um, the new norm is often now used to describe the current times. It sounds defeatist. Is your view the same? 100% the same. In fact, we've banned the term the new normal in our company and we refer to it as the better normal. And just that shift in thinking of it as the better normal, what can we learn from it? You know, MNC Saatchi Abel for many years wanted to go onto a hot desking, flexi time basis in terms of not making sure that all 350 people were behind their desks from 8.30 till five every day. But, uh, but our whole focus is around um, um, output, not input. And it's around uh, great results and great solutions. And people don't need to be in the office to do that. People need to be working, but not in a physical office. Now for us, COVID allowed us to trial 
the hot desking uh, methodology that we were too scared to trial because of that old adage, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. So we never wanted to work on a flexi time. So for us, it's a better normal in terms of being able to have people working from home, flexi time, uh, and to be output focused. Now that doesn't mean that we have fallen in love with COVID. I think people who talk about this as being a very special time um, either have the means to think of it that way and they're very lucky, but that's economically not what COVID has done for us at all. And I think a lot of people suffer from Stockholm syndrome in terms of having fallen in love with their captors. The reality is what we need to do is there's nothing like the water cooler conversation proverbially or metaphorically. There's nothing like warm bodies being in a, a meeting room together, looking eye to eye, seeing the smiles in each other's faces. So I don't celebrate this as, um, as a wonderful thing to have happened to the world, far from it. But where there are lessons to be learned, let's embrace those lessons. And where there is negativity that doesn't precipitate something positive, let's not focus on that. Well, thank you. There seems to be a, a few more questions, but this one is interesting. I'm going to try and combine this two. Telemusa, Nizamandi, and Destiny Pillay seem to ask something that are connected. Uh, Telemusa asks, can you kindly share the values of your company or your organization? Because I think that is important, the values of an organization. But then Destiny takes the question perhaps a little bit further. She asks, what are some of your key sources of inspiration and creativity for the work that you do? Can you perhaps deal with both in this? Thank you. Sure. So um, in terms of the people that join our company, we ask ourselves three very simple questions. Do we know them? Do we like them? Do we trust them? What we mean by that is what does their CV? What have they done? How do they present themselves in a meeting? Um, come across in terms of not do they have the requisite skills for the job? That is uh, essential, obviously but the soft questions of no, like, and trust. When we try and hire people, we hire people who are brave and who are bright. Those are two things that we look for, bravery and intelligence. And then we look for good people, for kind people. We want to be a force for good in society. So when you look at our company, we are a fully diverse and fully transformed company. From the day I allocated equity in MNC Saatchi Abel, um, I allocated the majority of equity for black South Africans living in South Africa um, because I wanted to drive transformation within our company and not in terms of doing any uh, transformation deals, but being a force for good in South Africa and representing the diversity of our country. So another value of ours is diversity of thought. So we believe in people from a diverse background um, coming up with innovative and resonant solutions. And the other value we have is we play to people's strengths, not to people's weaknesses. So often in the corporate world, um, people will find out what your weak spot is, what you're not good at, and scratch away at that, as opposed to finding out what you're brilliant at and putting other people around you to complement and supplement that which you may not be very good at. And so by having a generosity of spirit and by playing to people's skills and by having a firm, um, Sorry, uh, Dr. Jonas, we're using this term, having a firm no assholes policy. We end up having a company that is very tight, very cohesive. Uh, we are all on the field together. I like to use the football analogy. Um, we don't have Alex Ferguson in our company. There's nobody on the side of the field with a whistle. You're either on the field playing the game, kicking the ball, getting tackled like everybody else, myself included, or you're out the stadium. So everybody that is here, um, is, uh, is part of the team. I just happen to be the captain of the team. That doesn't mean like Sia, I don't get tackled and I don't get fouled and I don't get sent off. And the other thing that's really important is that we have a flat structure. So most uh, corporates or hierarchies have a pyramid structure where you have the CEO at the top and everybody cascades. We designed our company in terms of a rectangular structure, much like an architectural firm or an accounting practice um, where you have a whole lot of senior partners at the top that work together as opposed to being um, a hierarchy. Right. Um, Mike, just to maybe take this to the last question, brand South Africa, what can we do for it? And with the same brand, maybe brand Port Elizabeth, Mandela Bay. 
So I think, um, you know, South Africa has an abundance of wealth and opportunity. Um, and there's, there's an enormous opportunity that is wide open for us now. You know, if I ever look at um, a tiny little country uh, like in Israel, uh, which is called the startup nation today, you know, it's one fifth the size of KwaZulu Natal. That whole country is one fifth the size of KwaZulu Natal. And you look at its GDP and you look at how in a desert, how a country like that uh, innovated and came up with hydroponic farming where you don't need water, uh, but you just drip it on the roots. You look at the tech boom, how they are now second to Silicon Valley. What we need to do is to have a look at how we, to use that uh, rehash term, pivot. How do we look at South Africa and how do we pay very strongly to our strengths? Now, our growth is gonna come from two areas, domestic investment and foreign investment. And the first thing that we need to bring an immediate halt to is corruption. Because as long as there is corruption, people are not going to invest domestically and they're not going to, we're not going to attract foreign investment. So our president has got a myriad of people in South Africa who are unbelievably talented. Sadly, the wrong people all go into politics and the right people go into business. And politicians are not going to solve South Africa's problems. They aren't competent to solve our problems. They haven't run businesses to solve our problems and they don't have the wherewithal. Active citizenry, all of us together are the people that will solve South Africa's problems. Business, big business, small business, the everyday people of South Africa getting behind, solving our country's problems, doing it ourselves, mucking in, putting pressure on government, but uh, creating opportunity ourselves in our various sectors and categories will be the thing that changes this country. So we all need to be outspoken. We all need to, in our patriotism, and we all need to help one another, pull together, unlock our economy, create a sharing economy wherever we can. We need to be less selfish and more selfless, and we need to be forces for good. And I think that if we all pull behind a common goal of building our country and holding government absolutely to account, I mean, it's outrageous and unconscionable that uh, Ace Magashula, who's out on bail, is still the head of the ANC when the ANC has put out a statement that anybody involved in corruption will be kicked out the ANC or suspended. It's outrageous. And our country should never put up with that kind of crap. So we all need to become activists in our own right. And we all need to pull together in one direction to rebuild our country. The president has asked us for Tuma Mina to join it. He needs to join Tuma Mina and together we need to grow this country. Thank you very much, Mike, for those words of wisdom. And wasn't that a lesson in thought leadership? And I think our audience today agrees. You know, the messages coming through from our audience and people who were attendees were, it was an inspirational talk by yourself. Thank you very much for sharing. And I think perhaps the, the abiding lesson for me and for all of us, for many of us, is the idea of actually the generosity of spirit. That you spoke about the Jamie Oliver sharing his recipes is actually the lesson that you brought to us today. The second one, of course, learning from the best. And I think the important four facets that you mentioned here is your assets. You need to know what you are good for and what you are associated with. And of course, secondly, go beyond categories. And in terms of your communication strategy, of course, having a strong opinion, as you've just expressed, as far as Brand South Africa is concerned, I like that. It's recorded and it's good. People will learn from it. <laughs> we must be bold and brave to be courageous in these kind of things. And of course, the sharing part of your, of your, of your lesson today. Really a lesson in leadership. And I want to thank you for that too, so that you actually have inspired our audience to, to remember you know, uh, what, is, what, it, what it takes to be, to, be, to be great. And of course, lastly, I like the one about the frog. You know, kissing the frog, uh, 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 from which a prince or princess one day will pop up. You know, you've got to constantly dream bigger than what you imagine, you know, and, and that is important for us. Then lastly, our crisis actually teaches us lessons, but the crisis is preparing you for a triumph and a victory. And that was what I took to heart from, from what you were saying today. I see there's some more comments coming up here. I'm going to just quickly say, share them with you. Um, because there's more and more and more, and I hope that I will do justice to Paul. So again, um, an, an inspiring lesson. Uh, 
talk, affirming the sharing uh, does get you more. And of course, the enough, uh, Nadia Domingo says, we have enough people in our country to rebuild our country and turn around Mandela Bay to, to a dream city. I think somebody felt that the activation idea down the freeway was something to work on for, uh, for Mike and uh, Andrew and his team. And then um, many companies, Mike, coming from Tolusuma, are struggling with silo mentalities. And this becomes a cancer that kills the value that the customers are paying for. How do you champion this issue in your organization? That's going to be the last question to Mike. We have time. I think we've exhausted him tonight. Thank you. This is one more, Mike. Thank you. So I think that uh, when you leave ego at the door, anything is possible. And I think that silo mentalities come from people believing that they are um, experts in their particular field and don't believe in sharing or listening to people from other areas and other departments in organizations. And the reality is that what you learn in one department or in one part of a company can have a profound relevant impact on what happens in another. And so I believe in fervently uh, banging on that door until it either opens or until you break it down. But to never be accept accepting of a silo if the silo doesn't serve a purpose in growing the company, growing the product, growing the service, and growing its relevance. So um, I think have a healthy intolerance for a silo mentality. Thank you, Mike. And I think we have come more or less to the end of our session. I'm going to hand over to Paul now. And Paul will then just conclude the session for us. But once again, to our audience, thank you very much. And to Mike, a great talk. Thanks a lot. Paul? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Mike, thank you very much um, for sharing your time and expertise with us this afternoon. Um, you're well aware that our alumni are also the global extension of our university. Um, glad that you also mentioned other alumni so actively involved. Um, the, we started with these sessions and we are going to continue with them into the future. Um, so, so we want to ensure that we have as many of our alumni participate and sharing their skills and expertise like you have done today. Fantastic, we really appreciate it. Um, just to share, we have mentioned that um, when we marketed this um, event, that the first hundred will qualify for a book draw um, that we will do afterwards and we'll communicate that to the members. And also the first 50 people to complete the survey will also qualify for a draw. So, so we are just encouraging people to also complete the surveys. You know, those numbers are, are very important. Um, but um, to everybody here this afternoon who played a role um, in making this event possible and all the members who joined us, thank you very much. Um, we will be sharing more information later on about, uh, we have discussions with Mike about promoting his book as well um, that can contribute to um, some of the work that we are doing and, and we will share more information with that afterwards. Um, thanks, um, Mike and everybody. Um, I think our last message is going to be to all of you using the Mandela University slogan, go out and continue to change the world. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you very much again, Mike. Take care. All the Great best, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Chinese. Lovely to chat. Thank, thank you, you, Mike, and thank you, Paul. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.